Good morning, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity you gave to me to speak at this uh, important conference about the relevance of nutrition support in cancer patients, not only in general, but particularly during the COVID-19 era. These are my potential conflicts of interest, but I believe that my most important uh, conflict of interest is my passion for nutrition, particularly for cancer patients. Now, we know that uh, since uh, a few months, uh, COVID-19 is really ravaging all over the planet. At this time, uh, during the, the, there are countries in the world who are just uh, exiting from the most uh, uh, critical period of infections whether other countries are still in the middle of the pandemic. But of course, uh, COVID-19 has made a major impact uh, on not only on our life, but also on the healthcare systems. And we are going to discuss during the next 20, 25 minutes about the impact that COVID-19 had uh, on cancer, particularly on cancer care. We know very well, and there are now very good evidence about that, that COVID-19 has an impact on the diagnosis and the assessment of cancer patients, particularly of new cancer patients. There has been also an impact on the treatment the patients with cancer are receiving. We know very well that uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery has been prioritized based on anticipated outcomes. So the patient with the highest chances of getting the best uh, um, benefit from treatment were those who actually were receiving treatment first. Or for example, for surgery, patients in need of an urgent, of an emergency surgery then these were of the patients who actually received surgery. But of course, the changes in the time of diagnosis and on treatment also had an impact on the outcomes of cancer patients, including survival and mortality. And also, COVID-19 had a negative impact on cancer research. The vast majority of cancer trials are testing new approaches, new drugs, new treatments, were actually halted and postponed because it was uh, too risky to bring cancer patients to hospitals uh, during the follow-up of these cancer trials. The focus of my presentation will actually be on the first three topics of the influence of COVID-19 on cancer and about the diagnosis and assessment, uh, the impact on treatment, and more importantly, on outcomes. Let's start with the diagnosis and assessment. All over the world, there has been a significant reduction in the diagnosis of cancer, of new cancer patients uh, during the crisis. These are interesting data coming from the Netherlands. And you see that uh, there is a clear reduction on the, uh, re on the diagnosis uh, in the cancer, uh, of, cancer of, of cancer patients. You see going down particularly during the implementation of strict social distancing policies. So you see that by April the 6th, approximately one month after the uh, confirmed case of COVID-19 and the, and the nationwide implementation of strict social distancing, there has been a reduction in the cancer diagnosis of 25%, 26% to be, uh, to be uh, precise. And you see that particularly for the skin cancers, there has been a reduction by 60%, quite a large number of patients were not diagnosed, whose diagnosis were, was likely to be postponed. And let's talk about treatment for these patients. I already told you that uh, because of COVID-19, the treatment of cancer patients has been reprioritized. This is the national health system, the UK national health system scheme for prioritizing patients for systemic anti-cancer therapy. And the priority level one was for those patients with the curative therapy with a high chance of success. Pure priority level number two was for those patients undergoing treatment for curative therapy with an intermediate chance of success. 
as you may well imagine, if you go down to priority four, priority five, those are the patients with maybe advanced disease and less chances to get a benefit, which means that these patients will not receive the anticipated the treatment and probably they will have a negative impact on their clinical outcome. And in fact, we know that the outcome of cancer patient has been in influenced by COVID-19. First of all, I have to say that we know that uh, being a cancer patient is not one of the major comorbidity observed in patients with COVID-19. Nevertheless, patients with cancer and COVID-19 have a worse clinical outcome. Uh, these are data coming from China, and you see that uh, the patients with cancer, they actually had uh, a higher chance of, for example, receiving invasive ventilation or ICU admission. More importantly, you see that uh, the probability of severe events is much higher in patients with cancer when compared to patients without cancer. So the epidemiological studies so far published highlights that even if cancer is not the most frequent comorbidity of COVID-19 patients, nevertheless, having a cancer is associated with a worse clinical outcome. But the most striking influence of COVID-19 in cancer is about the outcome, but more importantly, the future outcome of cancer patients. These data I'm showing to you, uh, these are data coming from a extrapolation, a calculation an epidemiological calculation done in the, uh, in the UK and based on the National Health System database. So you see here that in the intermediate uh, scenario, so not, not mild, not very much severe, you see that you can have up to 6,000 more cancer death among patients with cancer and one comorbidity. You may see that 6,000 more cancer death in a one year time is not so high, but in the UK, it is 20% of the death burden, of the ear death burden, which means that delaying the diagnosis, delay treatment for these patients could be associated with a significant increase in the number of cancer death. Recent data are these coming from the US. This is a very, very interesting study which has been uh, recently uh, commented by uh, Dr. Sharpless. Dr. Sharpless is the director of the National Cancer Institute. And his institute was calculating which would be the impact over a 10 year period of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic in terms of uh, cumulative excess deaths from only two cancers, meaning colorectal and breast cancers. But you see that uh, only in the US and only in the, uh, for the uh, breast and colorectal cancer, it is estimated a significant increase in the number of uh, cancer death because of these two cancers. I can tell you that basically they is expected approximately 10,000 more death only in the US only for these two cancers uh, during the 10 year period of time because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, the COVID-19 influence. So you see that uh, postponing treatment, delaying treatment, reducing uh, the, the, the dose uh, of the treatment is associated with uh, a significant impact on the future clinical outcome of cancer patients. Now, the question we have to ask is, uh, is it really right to actually postpone or delay or reduce the intensity of anti-cancer treatment? Well, actually we have to come back to what is the real anti-cancer treatment. Let's make an example. If you are an athlete and you have to run until the arrival of the, of the run, you have to run on two legs, of course. Running only on one leg, of course, uh, will delay you 
and will maybe uh, did, uh, did not allow you to get to the arrival. This example helps me to tell you that we all know that the anti-cancer treatment is based on uh, two legs. Just a small, uh, a small um, uh, example. Let's say that uh, the patient is diagnosed with cancer, and of course, uh, if he uh, has an early cancer, he goes to the surgeon and is cured. But let's focus to the patients with advanced cancer. So the patients for, for whom delay because of COVID-19 will have a more negative impact on their clinical outcome. Well, we know that for these patients, the real, the global anti-cancer treatment is based on two legs, on two pillars. The disease-modifying therapy, which of course include the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immune therapy, surgery, and so on. And of course, this disease-modifying therapy is aiming at the cancer cells and provides a better survival for cancer patients. But the simultaneous other pillar, other leg of the anti-cancer treatment is a palliative care, supportive care which is, of course, nutrition. Nutrition has a major part in that, but also psychological support, pain control, physical therapy, and so on. We all agree that uh, palliative care addresses the needs of the cancer patients, and the goal is to improve the quality of life. But nevertheless, there are now very good evidence showing that when you combine disease-modifying therapy and the palliative care, when you implement these two legs, these two pillars together, you will also have an improvement in survival when compared to the patients receiving only disease-modifying therapy. And this makes sense because uh, you can run faster and for a longer distance uh, if you run with your two legs rather than on only one leg. Why I'm saying that nutrition is very important? Because we know that uh, changes in nutritional status are very, very frequent in cancer patients. Weight loss is uh, very common because of the presence of the tumor, but also because of the negative consequences of anti-cancer treatments. But please remember that uh, when a cancer patient we uh, loses weight, he unfortunately loses muscle mass, which is the most important and clinically relevant uh, um, part of the body composition. There are now hundreds of papers showing that uh, patients losing muscle mass are also those patients with the worst outcome. Uh, this, for example, is a study done with patients with the head and neck cancer, and you see that the patient with depleted skeletal muscle mass have uh, a reduced overall survival but also a reduced disease-specific survival. So it really makes sense that during anti-cancer treatment, or maybe when anti-cancer treatment is not provided because delayed uh, based on the uh, COVID-19 uh, um, uh, guidelines, then supportive care and nutrition should be implemented because it does not increase the risk of getting infections by SARS-CoV-2, but may better prepare the patient to receive anti-cancer treatment. And as I mentioned before, there are now many, many studies showing that when you combine anti-cancer treatment, meaning chemo, radio, immune therapy, surgery with supportive care, you will have a significant imp improvement of survival. You see here, for example, when palliative care is given between 31 and 365 days after diagnosis, you have a significant improvement in survival. Look at here. When it's given really at the beginning, you have almost 100% survival probability. And these are data now supported not only by this study, but my, many other studies showing that uh, the most effective treatment of a cancer patient with advanced disease uh, is combining 
disease modifying therapy plus of course supportive care and more importantly nutrition but how should we deliver nutritional care to cancer patients very very recently the european society for medical oncology have issued the uh, recommendation for supportive care and you see here that there are also recommendations for nutrition in the including the treatment and prevention of the reduction of appetite and interestingly the european society of medical oncology recommend that all patients should be offered assessment of nutritional uh, risk more importantly ESMO recommends that nutritional intake should cover at least 30 kilocalories and 1.0 to 1.5 gram per kilo body weight as well as the recommended daily allowance for micronutrients. So it's really, this is an acknowledgement by ESMO of the importance of nutritional therapy, not only when the patient is not, is not able, is not allowed to receive any kind of treatment, but particularly during the cancer treatment. Just to let you know that probably during the lab, after summer, during fall, ESMO we also published not only these recommendations, but the guideline for nutritional care for cancer patients, which are basically reflecting what has been already uh, given in the literature by other scientific societies. So, Again, I want to highlight what uh, the European Society for Clinical Nutrition has issued quite recently, showing the importance of uh, the energy intake and of course the protein intake. And uh, the recommendation by the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism published in Clinical Nutrition in 2017, recommend as, a, as a ESMO does, 25 to 30 kilocalorie per kilo body weight per day and one to 1.5 grams per kilo body weight per day. These are extremely important recommendations. And just to make things a little more clear, ESPEN recommends that uh, nutritional support should be early. Don't wait until the patient has lost 10 kilos, 15 kilos or more. The energy target should be 25 to 30 kilocalories per kilo body weight per day. The protein target, 1 to 1.5 grams, micronutrients. Of course, it is important to give uh, patients the opportunity to do, to do physical activity or exercise. And uh, this should be a stepwise intervention. The first level of intervention should be diet change in order to address the change in the taste, the change in the smell of the, of the cancer patients, and if it is not sufficient to meet energy and protein requirements, we should go to oral nutritional supplements, and if this is not sufficient, then to enteral nutrition, and then to supplemental parental nutrition. The goal of nutrition intervention would be to minimize weight and muscle loss during the catabolic phases, which is uh, surgery, which is chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and these uh, should be implemented, should be maximized uh, to restore what is, has been lost uh, during the recovery phase. Oops. Do we have some data showing that these approach, nutritional support, is important in improving the outcome? Well, we have a number of data. The first important uh, information comes from a study done a few years ago showing that in hospitals, uh, the probability of healthcare associated infections is significantly reduced when the patient is really meeting energy intake. You see that when the patient is eating 100% of the recommended energy intake, the probability of infection is really low. But of course, nutrition support is not only calories. There are a number of other nutrients which are extremely important for, particularly for the immune health, like the protein, which are extremely important for the cells in the immune system, and of course, also to produce the proteins in order to restore the muscle loss, which has been uh, devastated by the presence of the tumor. 
I just want to remind you once more the importance of protein intake. This is an interesting study, observational study, showing that when you have a cancer patient with advanced disease receiving, under, uh, receiving uh, chemotherapy, and uh, he or she has uh, a reduction, particularly in protein intake, this is associated with a reduction in survival. So having a cancer patient uh, eating low proteins and low level, low quantity of protein is associated with a significant increase in mortality. And more importantly, we also know that the muscle of patients, even with advanced disease, are still able to respond to uh, amino acid supplementation with good quality amino acid supplementation. Uh, this is a study showing patients with uh, lung cancer, advanced lung cancer, and you see that the ability of the muscle to build new muscle fiber is uh, identical in patients even with uh, no cancer. So the muscle per se is still able to respond to supplementation of enough quantity of good quality amino acids. And this is important. So it shows that cachexia, at least during the early and the moderate phase of the disease, is not unreversible. But unfortunately, to get these results in terms of improved anabolism, improved muscle mass, improved muscle function, improvement of quality of life, we have to take care of another important aspect, which is the inflammation. Uh, these are data coming from Switzerland, a large study showing that uh, in the presence of inflammation, the clinical effect on mortality um, is of oral nutritional supplements uh, is uh, of general uh, nutritional supplementations, including oral nutritional suppl supplements, is significantly reduced, which means that uh, you can have uh, positive clinical effects if simultaneously you address the nutritional needs, meaning calories, good quantity and quality of proteins, micronutrients, but also you also address the metabolism, the altered metabolism of the cancer patients, including the inflammatory response. And to do that, you can use, uh, of course, specific nutrients like the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, and particularly EPA, which has a negative effects on the pro-inflammatory cytokine production. These, uh, amino, these fatty acids uh, reduces the production of uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines, which are, you see, involved in most of the mechanism leading to the muscle loss and weight loss. So combining adequate calories, adequate proteins, uh, modulation of the inflammatory response by omega-3 fatty acids, you may have uh, the benefit, not only nutritional benefit, but possibly also the benefits on the, large, uh, on the clinical outcome. This is a recent study that I completed in patients with advanced uh, lung cancer. And uh, we were giving uh, enough omega-3 fatty acids to the, to the patients. And you see very well that the patients in the early phase of the cachexia not only had an improvement in the uh, muscle function, uh, as assessed by, in this case, with the hand grip test, but for the patients uh, with the not severe cachexia, but with the initial cachexia, we also observed a significant improvement of the survival. I have to say that the study was not the power to detect any effect on survival, but this is an information which highlights the role of uh, medical nutrition, adequate medical nutrition, specialized medical nutrition, in not only addressing the nutritional needs of a cancer patient, but also the metabolic needs of cancer patients, 
and this is associated with an improvement in uh, nutritional status, uh, muscle function, and possibly, possibly also on clinical outcome. There is another important aspect that I want to uh, discuss with you. Uh, there are recent data showing that uh, the metastatic uh, progression and the muscle atrophy, muscle wasting process share similar biochemical mechanism. If this would be uh, strengthened and corroborated by further uh, clinical studies, it is possible, of course, that an aggressive disease can have a more advanced and more rapid decline of uh, nutritional status. But it could also be possible that uh, modifying those mechanisms leading to cachexia will also have a positive effect on the mechanism leading to, uh, uh, to, to uh, metastatic progression. I'm not saying, I just want to be clear on that, I'm not saying that by using specific nutrients, uh, protein, high protein supplements, omega-3 fatty acids, you can cure or you can treat uh, cancer. Of course not. If you want to cure cancer, you need to use uh, chemo, radiotherapy. What I am saying is that uh, by using specific nutrients, uh, you can enhance the efficacy of uh, anti-cancer treatment. So not curing, but enhancing the effect of the standard anti-cancer treatment. So in conclusions, I think that uh, in this current COVID-19 pandemic, we are caught in a dilemma. Should we prioritize the treatment of cancer patients, but this would increase the risk of infection? Or should we delay the treatment but unfortunately, this will be associated with the risk of disease progression. I don't think there is any need to delay treatment because anti-tumor treatment is based on two pillars, disease-modifying therapy, and it could be wiser to postpone or may delay or reduce the intensity of disease-modifying therapy. But there is no need to delay or to postpone supportive care. So basically, you can start the anti-cancer treatment immediately when the diagnosis is made, even during the COVID-19 pandemic, because uh, you are immediately starting at least one of the pillar of anti-cancer treatment, supportive care, including nutrition, of course. Quindi, nutrition therapy should be started and continued during the current pand pandemic to prevent cachexia and, of course, the negative effects of, in, of, of cachexia on outcomes. Meeting energy and protein needs is necessary, of course, to maximize the benefits of nutrition support. And we can use the ESPEN recommendation, the ESMO recommendation, or the upcoming ESMO guidelines on nutritional support. What are the key elements for having a positive um, uh, effect on nutritional therapy? is the high protein oral nutritional supplements, and of course, the use of the specialized nutritional nutrients like omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, because they can mitigate the inflammatory response of cancer patients and therefore enhance the anabolic response given by high protein oral nutritional response. Therefore, this should be, can mitigate muscle loss and favor the clinical outcome. So you see that uh, even during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have strategies to start immediately our treatment in order not to cure a cancer patient, but to prepare the patient to receive anti-cancer treatment, uh, which at that time would be probably much more effective. And thank you again very much for your attention.